Hey, I know that you're sad about this, but this is the last video in our weather series. And today we're going to talk about occluded fronts. Occluded fronts are probably one that you are a little bit less familiar with. They don't necessarily talk about them directly on the forecast that you're going to watch on TV. But they're pretty important when it comes to understanding common weather patterns that we get here in the United States. So we're going to dive in, kind of apply some of the things that we know, and get to better understand what they're all about. So let's consider this situation. A continental polar air mass forming in Canada, meeting up with a maritime tropical air mass from the Gulf of Mexico. So we know the characteristics of each of these air masses and that they definitely will have very different densities. Uh, continental polar, cold, dry air, high density, whereas maritime tropical uh, is going to be humid and warm, very low density. Um, both of these air masses will have higher pressure at their centers and are pushing towards a pocket of lower pressure in the middle of the United States, as we're seeing on this map. So as they push towards each other, if neither air mass actually is advancing into the other, let's say they're happening to push with the same amount of force, what you're going to end up with is what we call a stationary front. And this would be the initial stage, stage, stage one, of our process of a storm development. And, and sometimes experts refer to this process as the mid-latitude cyclone. It's responsible for many of our storms that we get. So what we're gonna see is a symbol that looks like this one, where if you saw it in color, you get the alternating red and blue. But as we pointed out, you gotta recognize the shape of the symbols. So up when you find semicircles and triangles that are alternating and on opposite sides of the line. That's when we know this is a stationary front. And it tells us which direction the warm air is pushing, which direction the cold air is pushing. So we can clearly see that with this symbol. So this is our opening stage. Now, what is a stationary front? Well, it's it, as we said, two air masses are meeting and neither is advancing. As far as what you get, um, you know, or how do you get that, it's often, well, you know, that there's ne not necessarily that big of a pressure difference um, or a temperature difference. Now, the case that I just brought up, we did say that we would expect a big temperature or pressure difference. But sometimes when you see stationary fronts, it's because they don't have a very big one. Um, in some cases, it's just that they're pushing with about the same amount of force. What often happens with the situation that I presented is the stationary front doesn't last for all that long. It's, it's an initial stage and after a little bit it's going to change and we're going to show you exactly why as far as what do you get for weather um, you might get clouds i mean it's very common that you would get clouds because after all when the warm air is bumping into that colder air the warm air is less dense it's going to get shoved up and if you shove up warm air you often will get adiabatic cooling condensation cloud formation so we're, we're seeing some evidence of clouds in this picture um, it is possible that you could get a stationary front with no clouds, but it's also possible that you could get it with steady precipitation. So it really does range. There's not a universal when you have a stationary front, you're going to get this. So back to our map and our stationary front, what's going, what we're going to see is as the two air masses are pushing towards each other, we are going to see that the winds are going to be deflected by Coriolis effect. And so here comes the deflection. As we're pushing that air mass in, remember that deflection is right, but because these two air masses are pushing in opposite directions, right ends up seeming to go in different directions. So look at the net effect of this. The maritime tropical air mass is pushing more to the eastern side, whereas the continental polar is pushing more to the western side. The end result is that we're going to change this from a stationary front into, uh, because we developed the center of low pressure, um, because uh, as, as the air is pushing in, uh, it's kind of being swirled to the side. And you can see that we would end up with counterclockwise flow around the center of low pressure, just like that. 
and we end up developing these two different fronts. We get a cold front off to the west and a warm front to the east. And so this is stage two, the frontal wave. And so here we have um, these two different um, fronts with a center of low pressure. And um, what we're going to see is that over time, this is going to continue to change. Now, um, we get to stage three, and you notice that the shape looks different. The warm front doesn't really seem like it's moved all that much, yet the cold front has moved significantly. Now, recall the reasons why this would happen. Cold air being more dense is going to more effectively push through the warm air, and therefore, as a result, the front frontal boundary moves faster. So look at these pictures, and this kind of shows us what we would expect in each location. Um, the, the off to the west, find the cold front, we would expect perhaps uh, some heavy rain, perhaps a thunderstorm or so along that boundary, whereas we would get the steady precipitation associated with the warm front um, over in that region. So we have two different fronts that have developed out of the initial stationary front that we had. But as you can imagine, this doesn't last forever either. And so as time goes on, we're going to be changing this, and you can probably predict what's going to happen. That cold front that is moving faster continues to move faster, so it keeps going. And, um, well, actually I forgot, I'm going to show you this uh, profile stage first. So if we were going to look at it in a uh, profile, we would see there is a cold front with a little gap in between where you see warm air at the surface. And then we have a warm front out off to the east. So we can tell that the cold front and the warm front are both moving in the same direction. However, we know that the cold front is moving faster. And so it is going to catch up. And when it does, we call that an occlusion. So if a cold front moves fast enough that it actually catches up to a warm front, as it does in this situation, because after all, remember, it's being driven by the winds, which are pushing it, and so high goes to low, but Coriolis deflecting it to the right, so we're getting counterclockwise flow around that low pressure center, and the cold front now has caught up to the warm front, and it's caused the occlusion to happen. So um, let's take a look at what that looks like in profile view. So as you saw with um, picture A here, uh, it's just like what we were showing um, before with um, the cold, separate cold front and separate warm front. Uh, then we have the beginning of the occlusion where it's just started to catch up to the warm front. And so at that point, we're kind of merging these storms together. And then finally, we get to the mature occlusion in picture C. And so when we see this occlusion that's shown in picture C, what we're seeing is, all right, so it looks like a pretty intense storm at this time. However, we would say that this is a storm that's in its, really headed towards its dying stage. Because once you get a full occlusion like this, notice how the ground has no more warm air. All of the warm air has been lifted off the ground. And if you've already lifted all of the warm, less dense air off the ground, then you're not going to get rising air, so then you don't get condensation, and you don't feed your storm. So the storm is on its way out. So here is the recap of everything we just saw. Uh, we have a stationary front that, because of Coriolis effect acting differently on the two different air masses, produces a... Uh, frontal wave where we have both a cold front and a warm front with a center of low pressure. But because cold fronts move faster, we get an open wave stage where the cold front is sweeping around, catching up to that warm front. As it actually does begin to catch up, we call that our initial occlusion stage. And then we get the advanced occlusion or mature occlusion uh, stage. Um, and then finally, it dissipates, as they call it, a cutoff cyclone here. It's often referred to as the dissipated stage, where it basically is just a little pocket of low pressure and a stationary front. But basically, at this point, the storm has died out, and it, it's just uh, you know slight differences in pressure that remain at this point. So what I want you to kind of reflect on is, okay, so do I understand what a mid-latitude cyclone is? How does it involve both stationary fronts and occluded fronts? 
and how does this end up affecting our weather at different points in time. So as the next time you're looking at a map, look for the um, uh, development of frontal waves, um, open waves, and occluded fronts, because they're there. They're, they're common patterns in our weather. Uh, one final note on occluded fronts in terms of when you see those, I forgot to point out that the symbol um, is going to be when you see triangle half circle on the same side of the line. Um, you're noting that you can see that in the pictures that we're showing here, uh, both in starting out in day three where you have the initial occlusion, day four when you have a more mature occlusion, and then finally day five is um, still shown as an occluded front, but it, we're pretty much hitting the dissipating stage by the time we get to day five here. Um, so that's going to do it for our lesson on occluded fronts and mid-latitude cyclones. We'll see you in class.